fellow pastors, Derek and Susan Dunn, I'd like to welcome you to our 11 a.m. service. Now let us stand up on our feet and let us posture our hearts and posture our minds to receive God's word on this morning. Amen. Come on. I know they're a little far from you, but why don't you turn to your neighbor, smack high fives with them and say, are you ready to praise? Oh, we're here to praise your name, Lord. Hey. I got a song on the inside of me that I'm going to release this morning, so let's sing it out together. Oh, there's a song in my spirit. There's a joy in my soul. Yeah. 
already know. Let's continue clapping in this place. Oh, we give a sacrifice of praise to you, Lord.
turn to your neighbor and say, there's no one like our God. There's no one like our God. There's no one like There's no one like you. There's no one like our God. Oh. We say yes to your healing. Yes to your freedom. Yes to your victory. And yes to your power. We come in agreement. Our hearts are united. for greater things cause Jesus you're with us to all of your promises to all of your promises we see yes and amen we see
presence this morning. This is our communion Sunday, and I'd like the ushers to pin, pass out the elements. This is what Jesus paid the price for that we could boldly approach his throne. His body was broken, his blood was shed, he was bruised for our iniquity, for our transgression. Because of his stripes, we're healed. He suffered, he was crucified, he died, he was buried. He went to hell and he took back the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He took back all power, he took all authority. He rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, and he raised us up to sit together with him in the heavenly places, far above principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness. He made us the way for us to be sons and daughters that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He died for us so that we can live for Him. We're so thankful, Jesus. We're so thankful. Come on, just take the next 30 seconds. Just thank Him. Thank Him for loving you. Thank Him for dying for you. Thank Him for the price that He paid. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we're grateful, Jesus. We just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, Lord. For all that you've done for us. Jesus, we want to live for you. Father, we place our lives on the altar. A living sacrifice. Because he died. That we want to serve you all of our days. That we would be the temple of your spirit. As we've sung this morning, the Holy Spirit. We would know that you are here, that you are with us. That people would see Jesus through our lives. That we'd be the salt and the light of this world. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from every sin. The same power that raised Christ from the dead. Holy Spirit, you live in us. You live in us. Let us live for you. Let us shine for you. We love you. We're so grateful. We love you. Oh, we love you, presence. We love you. Thank you, Jesus, that you made a way for us. So thankful. Jesus. Oh, you're so good. You're so good. You're so good. 
love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Amen. What a wonderful presence. Come on, let's give the whole team a big hand leading us into his presence this morning. Amen. Nothing like the presence of God. We're so glad that you're here. I want you to just go around, greet three or four other people and tell them, I'm so glad to see you this morning. Amen. We want to welcome you this morning. We want to welcome all those that are watching online. We pray the presence of God is there with you this morning, wherever you are. And there's such a wonderful presence in the house this morning. We know you're going to be blessed. If you're just tuning in, you have a prayer request, a testimony, text the word hello to the number on your screen. If you're watching from overseas, you can actually go to our website at CCUS. Dot org and uh, fill that out there under the contacts and uh, we b- believe you're going to be blessed. Hey, chats are open, so put some emojis in there, say amen. Share this broadcast with someone. I got a great word. We know you're going to be blessed. Are you glad to be here? Amen. Amen. We want to welcome anyone visiting first time, second time in the house today. Anyone, we don't want to embarrass you, but if you're here, we're glad that you're here. Come on, give everybody a big hand for being here today. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Well, I just want to give you a few announcements. We had a powerful prayer meeting uh, yesterday on Saturday. How many are here for the prayer meeting? Our first prayer meeting was amazing, amazing, amen. And so we're going to be doing it a little bit different this year. No more Zoom, uh, bi-weekly prayer meetings, but the first Saturday, say first Saturday. Every month, first Saturday of the month, 9.30 to 10.30 is going to be our prayer meeting. We're also making it like a prayer school. And uh, we had a great time praying. And then afterwards, we evaluate a little bit. We want to help you to pray better. And Amanda did a great job uh, leading the prayer meeting. And uh, it, it was powerful. And so don't miss it. First Sunday uh, of the month, uh, excuse me, Saturday, first Saturday of the month. And so if you can, as much as possible, get here at 9.30 uh, to 10.30. We're going to keep it an hour. And then we'll evaluate a little bit. And you can still go to breakfast or lunch. Amen? Pray. Praise God. Also, we want to let you know we're going to be having our last Eve conference, second year of our conference, coming up. It'll be on July 27th through the 29th. So mark the date. If you're watching online uh, or here, you have the QR code there. You can put your name in the list. If you're on our church list, uh, we'll have you there. But want to keep you updated about what's happening. But we want to let you know, mark down those dates. All right, don't go on vacation in the summer during those dates. I mean, where, where would you want to go? We got everything here. We got palm trees. We got Mickey Mouse. We got, come on, City Harvest Church. Jesus is here. And so don't miss out. Uh, appointment, I believe, is going to be amazing. This is not just a conference for our church. Uh, it's an international conference. And so we have people last year coming from all over the world. People were so moved. And so many of the pastors came and said, you guys need to keep doing this. And so we're going to keep... Uh, doing it. I believe it's going to important for us to do this. And so men, mark, mark it down too, because we're going to be serving and uh, come alongside and uh, be there, be a part of it. Uh, it's going to be great. So take note of those dates. Uh, and then also we want to let you know if you're new to our church, we're having our welcome to church party. I believe it's on July uh, 19th, right after the service, one o'clock. Lunch is on us. And so we'll just proceed to the vision room. It's a time to hear about the vision of the church, where we come from, where we're going, uh, an opportunity to meet all the leadership of the church and uh, kind of hear the story and where we're going. So don't miss out on that. If you're new, you're watching online, you're not here today. And now uh, come on, let's pray for the health of our people. So many people have been sick recently. You know, I had it about three weeks ago, this flu virus uh, going around. And so many people got hit this week. So if you're if you're watching online, we say be healed in Jesus' name. And uh, we believe in God. Uh, we're going to get through this. It's the season. It's part of life. Amen. We live in a fallen world. But thank God for healing. And uh, let's begin to continue to pray for each other. You still happy? Amen. We're going to worship the Lord with our giving uh, this morning. God loves us. Uh, cheerful giver. It's offering time in the house. Pastor Susan's going to come. Come on, let's prepare our hearts to give. online this morning? That is a little bit of a feedback. Well, how many of you was, uh, were here for our service last Sunday? Well, I talked about the Abrahamic covenant, didn't I? And in Genesis 12, God came to Abraham and God made Abraham a promise. And God says that I'm going to bless you and you will be a blessing. And through you, all the nations shall be blessed. Amen. That was a great promise God came to Abraham to give to this man. And let me tell you that Abraham didn't know God. His father was an idolatry, uh, was an idol worshiper. The Bible says that Terah, his father, was an idol worshiper. So Abraham grew up not knowing God. Yet God came to make a promise to this man. Wow. And then we saw in Genesis 15, how God put Abraham to sleep. And God made a vow to Abraham. 
Remember the cut animal? And God walked through it. God put Abraham to sleep and God walked through it. Making a vow to Abraham that he is going to deliver his promise. And if he doesn't, he will be like the dead animal. He will be cut into half. Wow! But do you know that Genesis 15 is actually redundant? Because if God, the greatest King of all kings and Lord of all lords, the God of the heavens and the earth, if He says something, it is already established. Yes? So for Him to do this act, for Him to put Abraham to sleep and begin to show Abraham and walk through the cut animals, it is redundant. But God was moved so much that He made a vow to the created to the man that he had created. What happened? Because Genesis 14 happens. After God promised Abraham in Genesis 12, Abraham, something happened and Abraham did a response that moved the heart of God. And in Hebrews 7, talk about the encounter in Genesis 14. So we're going to show the verse right now, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father. This is describing Melchizedek. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning nor or beginning of days, nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Meaning that Melchizedek, this king of Salem, Melchizedek, is God personified. So when Abraham had won the battle against Sodom, and when he was on his way, he met this king of Melchizedek. Abraham immediately recognized that this Melchizedek is God personified. And out of his heart of gratitude towards God, remember Genesis 12, God promised him. Out of his gratitude to in his heart for God, Abraham took the initiative to give a tithe. So there you have it guys. Tithing didn't start with God. It started with a man called Abraham. And because he gave God and trusted God, it moved God's heart so much that God in Genesis 15 appeared to him and made a vow and said, from this day forward, I will perform my vows to you and nothing that you ever do will remove this covenant that I have with you. Everyone say, wow. Consider the manner of man Abraham is. That he would love God and respect God and help God in all so much that he will make a decision to give to God that will move God to make a vow. Wow, how does our giving move God today? This man started this statue of tithing. And God recognized tithing as a covenant practice. So from that day forward, He commanded generations after generation to follow Abraham's way of remembering the covenant. Everyone say wow again. When I studied this, I was held in awe of this man Abraham. I don't know a lot about him. But when I study him, I say, what kind of man is this? That could move the God of this heaven through his giving. Because he was not told to give a tithe. No one told him to give a tithe. But he was moved in his heart because he knew he encountered God. How many of you have encountered the God of heavens in your life? How will your giving move God this morning? But what really choked me to tears on Sunday in the second service, I was moved to tears. Because at that moment while preaching to you, I had that revelation that yes, Abraham gave to God and moved God. 
But my revelation is that God would allow Himself to be moved by men. Do you understand this? That's so powerful. That we, the created, can move the heart of God. That God would allow Himself to be moved by you. So much so that He would give a vow to humanity. That from this day forward, that you shall be blessed in your incoming and outgoing. You will be above only and not beneath. That your kneading bowl will always be full. Your vats will always flow with new wine. That you will be blessed. You and your children and their children shall be blessed. A thousand generations shall be blessed. Isn't that amazing? You know, I told you that last Sunday, I'm very, this story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is very real to me because I'm very much like Jacob. I've always been running away from God since young because I never had a father. I never knew my father. I never knew what it means to be protected, to be provided. So even though I became a believer, I never really trusted God to provide for me. It is always based on my ability, my education, what I can do. And God had to chase me down. In 1997, God came into my life and God said, Susan, it's time to stop running. Come, follow me. Go and be trained in Bible school. I said, no, God. I'm, I'm not called to ministry. I want to be a businesswoman. I want to give to you. That was just an excuse. Because I couldn't trust God that God would provide for me. So I say, no, Lord. And God had to pursue me. And you heard this story, some of you. That in 1998, God had to pursue me just like Jacob. God pursued me all the way to Milan when I was in the hotel room. And God visited me. And God says, would you follow me? This is my last call on your life. This is my ultimatum for you. That day, God put a finger in my socket. And God showed me that even though I came, I came to the house of God, even though I tithe to God, even though I give to God, God, the money of my life is still my God. So He put that finger in my socket. And from that day on, I gave my life to the Lord fully. And what happened? I went to Bible school just as He has instructed me in 1998. And in 1998, I went to Bible school. And then after that, in 1999, after I graduated, the word of the Lord came to me and God promised me this. In Proverbs 31, verse 26 to 31. I'm not going to read everything. But He says, and at that, and that point, I was still single. I was not married yet. He said that you shall have a husband. And He says, your husband shall praise you. Hint, hint. Derek, <laughs> your husband shall praise you. And then he says, your children will rise up and call you blessed. And then he says in 31, that you will be prosperous in your work and your work will praise you in the gates. Mind you, when the word came, I was a nobody. I just came out from, from Bible school. I was broke. I had to restart my business because it was recession in Asia. I didn't have a husband. I wasn't dating Jared was not in anywhere near my view. But God made me a promise. God says, from this day forward, I will bring you on a journey and I will transform your life and you will be the depictment of Proverbs 31. No, I'm not perfected yet. I'm still in that journey. But yet God had been faithful. God promised because I was willing to give not just my tithe and my offering. I was willing to give Him my life. Amen. How many of you know God is faithful? So this morning as we take up our tithe and our offering, how will your offering move the heart of God? That year in 1998 when I gave God everything, it started something in my life. It's moved God to that place where God will speak to me and say, from this day forward, you will become this woman. How will your offering, how will your giving reflect what your heart for God and your trust in Him that He shall be 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the same God will be to you. So this morning, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to just come before the Lord and ask God, what shall I give to you, Lord? What shall I give to you that will represent my trust in you? That will represent my love for you? That will speak of what we're going to do together in this journey of my life. Father, I pray for all your sons and your daughters that they will not be afraid to give to God because you are the God who owns the cattle over a thousand hills. That everything on the, on the earth and in heaven belongs to you. That the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is still the God of our life. That you are vehement to perform your covenant. That you are chasing us down just like you chased Jacob down so that you can perform your covenant. So that you will be like Joseph, the God of Joseph. That Lord, whatever we sow, even in a time of uncertainty, that we will get, Lord, a hundredfold harvest. That we will lack nothing. That as you have promised Abraham, that truly, O oh God, that we will be blessed to be a blessing. That through us, all the nations of the world shall be blessed because you have raised us up to be a peculiar nation, a holy nation, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood for your kingdom. So Holy Spirit, I pray right now, begin to speak into our hearts. And Lord, call us out, Lord, to begin to give what you want us to give so that as we give, oh God, Lord, that this offering will bring a sweet aroma into your presence and it will move the heart of our God. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. There are many ways you can give. The ushers have offering envelopes. If not, you can give through Pushpay app. You know uh, the drill. And uh, if you don't have the Pushpay app and you want to give privately, you can text the word GIVE to 949-446-1110. All those who are online, I want to encourage you, if God move your heart to give, give generously and believe that God will give it back to you 34, 64, 100 fold. Your tithe belongs to the Lord, but give generously offering according to God's instruction. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you a cheerful giver? And hear your neighbor say, yes, I am. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, video crews, please roll the video highlight. Thank you. Welcome to City Harvest Church. We're so glad that you're here today. It's our desire that you would encounter the loving presence of God. Yes, and we are a diverse and multicultural church family that is united by our love for God, our love for people, and our love for life. The very heartbeat of our church is connection. So come and find out the many different ways that you can get planted and flourish here at CHC. The Spirit of God is the life giver. He wants to transform individuals, families, communities to impact the world around them. that you're joining us today. You are in for a powerful message. So be sure to lean in. You can pull out your phones, your notebooks, because you are definitely going to want to remember this timely word that is coming straight from the heart of God. 
Praise the Lord. Welcome back. If you're just tuning in, uh, you can text the word hello to the number that's there on your screen, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. If you have a testimony or prayer request, uh, chats are going th today, so uh, say amen, put an emoji in there, uh, hit the share button and share this with somebody so that they can be blessed too. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on empowering messages like this, and uh, make sure that you don't miss out. Are you still happy today? Yeah. Amen. Awesome. Well, we want to let you know we're going to be starting the 11 o'clock service at 11 o'clock, all right? So I know some of you came in like, what's going on? We were normally running over a little bit, but we met with the leaders, and we're going to, try, we're going to do our best to start. If the Holy Ghost is moved, we're going to take the Holy Ghost out to the parking lot, and then you guys can come in and just get started. But uh, we're, we're going to, I'm just kidding, but we're going to, we're going to uh, do, do, uh, be, be a bit more conscious of time and really want to keep the 9 o'clock service t uh, tight as much as possible so we can start, especially for our new friends that are coming in um, that we're starting on time. So turn to your neighbor and say, get here at 1045. All right, come on. <laughs> and uh, get a good seat. And we'll be starting at 11 o'clock sharp uh, for, uh, moving forward. So take note of that. And I know some of you are a little surprised today. We ended, I was like, we did it. So praise God. And had a great 9 a.m. service. We didn't shortchange them. But uh, glad you're here. I believe God saves the best for last. Amen? Amen? Father, we just thank you for a wonderful time of praise and worship. We thank you for this year and the things that you have in store for us, far above what we could think or imagine or the things that that you prepare for us. And God, today, as you begin to speak to us, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, the downloads that you're wanting to put into our heart, that we can position ourselves for a great year in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. tell your neighbor, I'm glad you're seated next to me. Come on. The title of my message today is The Kind of People God is Looking For. How many want to be the kind of person God's looking for? Amen. You say, what do you mean God's looking for people? Yes, he's looking for people. Uh, and, and what kind of people is he looking for? Jesus said he's looking for people of faith. And he said in Luke chapter 18 and verse 8, Jesus said this, when the Son of Man comes. Now, Jesus is speaking, so it's not talking about I'm coming the first time. It's talking about when he comes back. He says, will he find faith on the earth? Will he really find faith on the earth? And the Bible says in the last days that what happens? People will come to the place where we have a form of godliness. We go through the religious habits, the religious things. We go to church on Sunday or we go through all of our meetings. But what happens? There's no power. They deny the power thereof. What is that speaking of? It's not just talking about the power of God in manifestation. It's talking the power of God to transform our lives and to bring us into the stature and the nature and the fullness of Christ. Jesus said in Ephesians 4, he said he, he, he founded the church and he put the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers in the church to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry that what we would all come into the unity of the faith and take on the stature, someone say stature, stature. Nature, nature, and the fullness of Christ. Now, that's an ongoing process, but what is God's goal? That is, we're pursuing him as we accept Jesus. He died for us. He took our sin away. He's a, he's a wonderful Savior, but that's just part of it. He said he wants to be Lord. Yeah. And what is lordship? That we're pursuing God, and we're wanting to become more like him. Yeah. Yeah. That we hate what God hates. We love what God loves, and we're living our life wanting to become more like Jesus. Is that your desire? Amen? Amen. Yeah. And we looked two weeks ago about the five solas that the uh, early apostles and the founders, they, they put into the church. During the Reformation, uh, they put this into the church, that these are the things that are the five essentials, the five solaces. And for those that weren't here, number one is sola scripture, which means scripture alone. Yeah. That the word of God, the Bible alone, is the highest authority. It's higher than any laws of man. It's higher than any other book. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit through the authors, 66 books. It's the will of God, the purpose of God, so we can know the Father, we can know the Son, amen, and we can know what's important to God. We build our life on the Bible. Number two, solos Christos, which is Christ alone, that Jesus Christ is the only Lord, he's the only Savior, He's the only king. The Bible says there's one way to God. There's no way to the Father except through me, Jesus said. Yeah. Well, that's not very nice, Pastor. What about other religions? People might get offended, but it's the truth. Yeah. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Sometimes the, the truth, it's a little hard to swallow, but it will set us free. And so we've got to say it's about Jesus only. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. We don't pray to Mary. We don't pray to Martha. We don't pray to Luke. We don't pray to Apostle Paul. We don't pray to Apostle Peter. We got a direct hotline to the Father through Jesus. Yeah. That's the Bible. Yeah. Jesus only. 
Amen. Say amen. So, well, I know some people, they do pray to Mary and all that. Well, that's not in the Bible. Yeah. Are you here? So we've got to follow the Bible. Jesus said it. If Jesus said it, it's written in red, let's stick with the red. It means it's important. He made it easy for us, right? Number three, sola fide, which means faith alone, that we are saved through faith alone in Jesus Christ, that we have to put our, our life, we live a life of faith. The just shall live by faith. We walk by, not by sight, but we walk by faith. It's a life of faith, a believing God. How do we get faith? Faith comes by hearing the word of God. So it flows together. Yeah. And then number four, sola gracia, which is grace alone, that we're saved by the grace of God alone. So we put faith in Jesus Christ as a Savior, and because of grace, it's a free gift that we receive from God. You can't buy salvation. Someone tried to buy the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and Paul rebuked them. They tried, what must I do to be saved? It's not about our works. You've got to put faith in Jesus, and you've got to follow Jesus. And the grace of God, it's a gift. You say, well, I know some people, they're saved, but they still ain't walking, right? They're under grace. Thank God for grace. But grace will lift. One day we'll be under, there'll be the judgment, the dispensation of judgment. <laughs> so you better get it right during the grace time. Come on. Are you here? But grace covers us where, where there's grace and God, even though we're imperfect, we can still approach the throne of God. Even though we're imperfect and God's working in our life and making us more like him, he, he doesn't condemn us. And so thank God for the grace of God. We can't earn it. It's a free gift. And finally, number five is solo, soli dia gloria, which means to the glory of God alone. Everything we do, we live to glorify God. We live to let Jesus be lifted up, that he would be glorified. We build our life around wanting to glorify God. We glorify him in our relationship. We want to glorify him in our families. We want to glorify him in our church. We want to glorify him in our business. <laughs> and everything we do, we want to glorify Jesus. Amen. So God is looking for these kind of people. And much of the church, we don't follow these five criterias. Are you here? You know, many times the word is not preached. People don't know the Bible. But we've got to build our, ourselves on these things because this is what Jesus is looking for when he returns. In Ezekiel 22 and verse 30, the Bible says this. <laughs> it says, so I sought for a man among them who would make a wall. And stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. So what does it say? God was looking for a man that would what? Would stand on his behalf on behalf of the land. Which means what? Would, would begin to say, I want to see his kingdom come. I want to see his will being done. And would make us stand to build what God yeah. wants to build. What's the wall speak of? It speaks of what God is building. Yeah. And so God is looking for those that will stand up for what he's wanting. That will stand up and, and, and like Joshua says, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That will stand up like Nehemiah and be burdened for the way that things are and say, we're going to rise. We're going to build what God wants to build. Come on, believe that, give the Lord a shout, amen. He said those that would stand in gap, in the gap, but, but that, that I wouldn't destroy it, that destruction wouldn't happen. But he said, I found no one. Isn't it sad that God couldn't find anyone? Out of all the creation, out of all the people that were around, in, in this time, he couldn't find one. So God is looking for a woman. He's looking for a man who will stand in the gap for, for one, that will rise up and what? Be a leader. Will be a leader. We're all called to lead. What do we lead? We lead in speaking and doing what God says to do. Are you here? So God is looking for men, a woman. God always has men and women. That's why he puts five-fold ministry in the church. He has men and women. But God is not looking for just a few men or a few women. He's looking for a people. The Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, for the eyes of the Lord run to and throw the whole earth to show himself strong. What? On behalf of those, not just the one, but on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal towards him. So he's looking for a people whose hearts will be loyal to him. Remember in Exodus when God called, uh, you know, the, the Jewish people out of, they weren't the Jewish people yet, but they were, they were uh, of his lineage. They weren't Israel yet, but they came out. They were his chosen people. They were the sons and daughters of Abraham. And they're in, in, in so God calls them out. And what did he say? I want all of you people to come up to the mountain to meet with me. But they looked at the mountain and there was thunder and lightning. It's a little hot up there. So they said, no, 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 we're scared. Moses, you go in here from God. We'll stay here. 
So Moses goes up, and he, he's a bull man. He goes up, and he begins to commune with God. God begins to give him the Ten Commandments. And what are the children of Israel doing? They're down there melting all the gold earrings, melting and building a calf. They got into idolatry because they didn't want to approach God. But God ultimately was looking for a people. He still wants a people. If he can't find a people, he'll start with a man. He'll start with a woman. But what's the goal? Come on, if you're a leader, how do you know you're leading? Because people are behind following you. Well, I'm a leader. Well, who are you leading? Well, I got a Facebook platform. Well, you only got three likes. That's not a lot of influence. Get into church. Come on. Start doing, get, 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 everybody wants to have a platform, but no one's following us. If no one's following us, who are we leading? And I'm, there's a place for that. Think about what I'm saying is, you know, we got a leading, we've got a, a great anointing. Well, who's following? Who's being impacted? Where's the fruit? Are you here? And so we, we've got to come to the place where we begin to, to have that heart for God that we're going to be, hey, I'm going to be one of God's people. I'm going to be the man. I'm going to be the woman. What kind of people is God looking for? What kind of people does God use? Number one, God is looking for a people who will serve him. We see in the verse here, he's looking for the people that would serve him, that would build the wall, that would stand in the gap. And so many people, they say they love God, but they don't want to serve God. Wow. Well, I'm not, I don't go to church very often because God knows I'm tired. <laughs> I work very hard during the week, so I need a break. Wow. It's, a, it's, it's too far to drive. I love what Apostle Les says. He says, live near your church and drive to work. Why? But how are you gonna how are you gonna serve God? How are you gonna be involved if, if so far you can't be involved in anything? You know, and some people do. We have, you know, we have Avon and Tim, I think they live one of the farthest away, but they're in prayer meeting, they're here, they're driving. But it's a sacrifice. Some people live five minutes from church and can't show up on time. And they're driving 40, 45 minutes sometimes, an hour, if there's traffic. Are you here? But what does that be be a place where it's convenient for you to be involved? In, in what God is doing and serving and have uh, things. Are we saved by serving? No, we're saved for serving. Yeah. We serve, why? Because we love God. Yeah. The Bible says, well, if I love my family and I don't provide for my family and serve my family, I'm worse than an infidel. Mm-hmm. I'm worse than a heathen. Because if you love, you're gonna provide. If you love, you're gonna be involved. I'm not gonna be an absentee father and never be around yeah. because I'm busy doing something else. Are you here? So we, we've got to be people that are build our life around serving God. Yeah. What does that mean? Exodus 8 verse 1, as they brought the children of Israel out, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, go to Pharaoh and say to him, let my people go. How many of you heard that? Yeah. But we only preach the first part. <laughs> let them go. Go where? <laughs> let them go that what? They can serve me. God's looking for a people. He's looking for a nation that will serve him. The word people there, it means a congregated unit. It speaks of nations. God's looking for nations, looking for people that can be used by God. I believe in America, we're called to be a nation. That's why our founding fathers put in one nation under God. Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And our whole constitution, the amendment, are based on that freedom to be able to worship God. That freedom where there's separation, where the, the government cannot come into the church and tell the church how to do things. Yeah. And we need to abide by all the laws, but they can't come in and control the church like, like the King of England was doing during that day. Amen? And so that was the founding father. You can't get away from that. Even the liberals are trying to get away from trying to rewrite. You can't get away from it. Yeah. Even if you come militarily, we have the right to bear arms and defend our right and our freedoms. Well, we don't like that. Well, it's there. It's written in black and white. You can't get away from it because the wisdom of God in the founding fathers. Thank God we're the only nation that has that. We're, we're, religion is under assault. We have those values because God put this as a nation that would show his freedom. And what happens when you honor God? What does it mean to serve? It comes from the Greek word abad, which actually means to work. But it also means to worship. So what did he say? When he said, I called them, let them go, that, that they could what? Worship me. And out of that relationship with me, they'll stand in the gap. Yeah. They'll build the wall. Yeah. I will be their God and they will be my people. And what will they do? We'll they'll begin, we'll begin to bring the purpose of God into the earth. Yeah. That's the example of Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. 
Take up your cross and follow me. Who was Jesus following? He said, I don't desire to do my will, but I desire to do his will, that his will would be done. Come on, that his kingdom would come. That's our desire. If we want God to, to use us, God, use me. I want to serve you. It's not about building my kingdom. It's about building your kingdom. And let me tell you, when you build his kingdom, he'll take care of you. You build God's house, he'll take care of you. Come on. Jesus gave his life to serve. He was our example. In Mark 10, verse 45, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but he came to serve. And he gave his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve. Why? Because he wanted to give us an example that, hey, I'm serving you. Salvation is free, but guess what? Now you're a living sacrifice. Now you follow me. And as we do that, we do that out of love, not out of compulsion. It's the most exciting life we can live as a life as a Christian and partner together with Jesus. Amen? And so Jesus, as, he, as we serve Jesus, it requires perseverance. Is it difficult sometimes? Is it hard sometimes? Does it, in, 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 it require sacrifice? It does. That's why the Bible says endure hardship like a good soldier. So the Bible says, don't get ensnared in civilian living because you're now in the kingdom of God. All those verses, like, oh, some of us have never heard those verses. It's in the Bible, all through the Bible. Yeah. Because that, that, that's all, our life is not our loan. It was bought with a ransom. So we've been bought with a price. Yeah. It was an expensive price. So we're living our life for God. We need to get back to serving. But, you know, sometimes in our Western culture, we don't want to serve nobody. I ain't no slave. I ain't no slave, I ain't serving nobody. I'm here to serve. We think God's serving us. Now, I heard one pastor say, we put God and he's like the little genie. We come and we do our little worship and we rub the little genie box. Gimme, 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 gimme. And then put God back in the genie box and don't talk to me about what I, you want me to do. That's not Christianity. We seek first the kingdom of heaven. All things are added to us. But sometimes when you're seeking first the kingdom of heaven, the things you thought you wanted, you don't really want anymore. The things you thought you needed, you didn't really need anymore. Come on. And God begins to work in our heart. But our God will supply all of our needs. But what's our life? Solomon said this at the end of life. I mean, he had all the women. He had all the gold. He had all the prominence. And he said this vanity is vanity. All is vanity except to seek God, to serve him, and to keep his commandments. Come on, we can learn something from the wisest men. Amen. We need to serve God. God's looking for those that have a heart to serve him. Number two, God's looking for a peculiar people. Yeah. Got one amen on that. Yeah. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're peculiar. Come on. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> that word peculiar is not what we think. You know, and some Christians are peculiar. I met some weird, strange Christians. <laughs> you know, and they're out in the clouds all the time and they're a bit woo, 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 woo. And you know, I'm a spirit-filled Holy Ghost guy, but I'm not weird. Come on. You know, we don't have to be weird to be spirit-filled. They were weird before they got saved. That's the thing. So it's not about Jesus. They were already like that, all right? So, so God uses different people and different personalities. But peculiar doesn't mean strange. It doesn't mean weird. Are you here? The Bible says in Deuteronomy 26, verse 18, And the Lord God avouched thee this day, he said, to be his peculiar people as he hath promised thee, and that thou should keep all his commandments. But what does it mean? When we talk about being a peculiar people, what does the word peculiar mean? It means a special treasure. Wow. Peculiar, actually the word means a, 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 a special treasure. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a special treasure. That's what God's saying. It's peculiar. It, it, it's something that's priceless. It's something that's not normal. It's something that stands out as peculiar because it's so valuable. Yeah. It comes from the Latin word peculiar, which actually means, well, sorry, peculium, which actually means private property. It means private property. So what does it mean? It's private property in the sense that it's a treasured possession that belongs only to God. God is a jealous God. He wants us to be peculiar. He wants us to be set apart for him. Amen. So we are people that stand out from the world, though. We are peculiar to the world because we're set apart according to God to bear his standard, to bear his name, to carry his values, to speak forth his word. Are you here? In Deuteronomy 14, verse 2, it says, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord God has chosen you as a peculiar people unto himself. 
above all the nations that are upon the earth. So God says, this was originally for the children of Israel, but we're grafted into the covenant of Abraham through Jesus Christ, but his plan hasn't changed. Jesus came to deal with the sin issue. Abraham, I mean, came in and he was a seed of faith. And he's the father of faith, but it started with Adam and Eve. And God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Be my people, yeah. subdue the earth, raise up a family that will worship me. Yeah. And they messed it up. But Jesus came and he put things back in order. Come on. Amen. So it's okay. You can call me peculiar all you want to, all right? I belong to Jesus. Amen? Amen. There was... You know, in the world that we live in, when we belong to God, people look at us and they may think it's strange. They may think we live to a different standard because right now, what, what is everyone talking about? They're talking about pop culture. And not everything about popular culture is bad. I thank God we're not wearing bell bottoms. You know, culture is not bad. You know, in some cultures, you know, they wear a three-piece suit. We went to Brazil with the team and it's 100 degrees out there and humid, 90% 90, 90 humidity. And we had to wear suits. We had to wear ties. I was like, Jesus, help me. <laughs> but that's the culture. Thank God I live in California. I mean, God put me in the right place. We can dress down and, you know, still look nice and be smart, casual, we call it. Look smart, but come on, I don't need a tie to have the anointing. But we honor the culture. So some certain cult, things about culture aren't bad. I like our cultures. I like palm trees. I like the fact, I talked to my dad, it's 24 degrees in Virginia, and it was 65 here. Amen? There's certain things that are not bad in our culture. There's certain things that, that are good, but, but we must embrace heaven's culture. Are you here? Yeah, amen. And, and when we do that, we're considered peculiar many times to the world. Recently, I put up, there was an article that came out. I don't know if you saw the news spin in Fox News, and the article was this. First Baptist Church faces backlash on biblical sexuality pledge for congregants. I think we have a picture, guys, if you can put that up. And what happened? It came out in the news, and it was a pastor who basically stood up and said, we believe marriage is between a man and a woman. Let me put it up again, guys. Marriage is between a man and a woman. And what, it hit the news. Because he asked his congregants, he said, if you're a member of our church, you need to embrace what the Bible teaches. And so in our membership covenant, you need to know what the Bible teaches so that we know you're embracing the faith, you know? If you say you're a Christian and you don't believe everything the Bible says, how can you say you're a Christian? It's a contradiction. Are you here? It's like I'm an American. When you become American and you're an alien, you become a citizen, you pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and it's a republic. And, and you, you got to know what you're signing up for. Come on, it's not, I just get U.S. dollars, that's all I want. No, 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 what is this country about? There's, there's a standard to it. And so he told his people that, and there was a whole backlash. People came out and said, you're gay bashing, and you hate gay people, and all this stuff. It was a huge battle. And I love what he responded. I want to read this to you. The pastor responded and said this. He says, we want to welcome you as we all were welcomed. If you need help, we'd love to serve you. If you would like to come and worship with us, you're always welcome to be a part of what we're doing. Of course, when you come, we will ask you to respect our beliefs just as you want us to respect yours. Yeah. But if you do come, we will welcome you, we will pray with you, we will serve you, we will love you. We will also probably say some things that will challenge you. Yeah. That's okay because real love can handle disagreement. Wow. I love it. Come on, yeah. That's the Bible. And he went on to say this. He said, if you ever give us the chance, we'll be happy to welcome you. We'll do that not because we agree with your sexuality, but because we believe everything the Bible says about loving your neighbor. And we really think it's possible to disagree without being hateful. Yes. Come on, that's, that, that's peculiar to the world. Because the world says, if you don't agree with me, what I'm doing, I'm going to unfollow you on Facebook. You're not my friend anymore. Don't, you're too political, unfollow, defriend, block. Are you here? But come on, I'm friends with people that I don't agree with everything. I have pastor friends that don't have the same theology as me. They don't have a Pentecostal spirit-filled theology. They have a, a, you know, a cessationism theology, but we can still be friends. They're not bad people. We can agree to disagree, but they know who I am and I know who they are, but we still love Jesus. We can agree to disagree. When people come to church, just because you're in the church, do we agree with everything about you? Do you agree with everyone sitting on your left or right? Are they perfect? 
No, we have adulterers come to church. We still love them. Yeah. We have people struggling with addiction and maybe they have substance abuse and they're addicted to alcohol or to, to uh, you know, uh, drugs or maybe they're struggling with sexual addiction. Do, do we, well, we, we, don't, we don't accept you. No, we love everyone. And what happens is we come to God, God works with us. What did Jesus say? Don't try to get the splinter out of someone else's eye when you got a log in your eye. Come on, I got enough, I'm busy enough worrying about my own life and my family. Come on, I ain't here to get in your business. You know, sometimes God gets in our business and there's a plate, but, like, but we're not here to micromanage you. We're not, we preach the word and you have a, a choice to hear the word and do it or not do it. If you hear the word and do it, there's a blessing. If you hear the word and don't do it, then you don't have the blessing. You know? And so it's a choice that we live. Jesus said, choose life or choose death. It's your choice. Yeah, and you will eat the fruit thereof. We're all responsible for our choices. We got to take responsible for our choices. None of us are victims. Sometimes I talk to people, oh, I can't believe my family members like this or this is like this. And it's the devil and all that. And the devil's probably definitely involved, but they made wrong decisions to get them in the place they're in. And we can't take responsibility for people that make the wrong decisions. They got to take responsibility for their wrong decisions. And we hopefully can learn and have the right decision. And we can pray for them. We can help them as the Lord leads. Yeah. But like, I'm not going to reinforce or, or sow into someone who's making wrong decisions. Yeah. All I'm doing is helping. Sometimes I need to have a wake-up call and hit a wall yeah. and realize we need to turn around. Amen. The, the prodigal son had to go live with the pigs yeah. before he had a change of heart and came back to the house. Are you here? Yeah. And so, so that's part of, of how things are. But we need to love people and know that we can agree to disagree. I tell you, people can come. Come as you are. Yeah. But let's not leave as we are. Yeah. <laughs> let's, if we keep coming, we keep pursuing God. What's happening? We're changing and God's working in our life and changing us so we can become more like him. Amen. Amen? And that's peculiar. Yeah. But that's the kingdom. We're also peculiar to the world. Why? Because sometimes we do things differently. Yeah. This kind of reaction is different. People don't understand that. We live differently. We, we talk differently. We have different morals. Yeah. We live according to different values. Now, people can do whatever they want to. Can people live together? Can two men live together? Can two women live together? They can. Now we have all sorts of stuff going on out there. You know, people now in some states can even marry their dog. Okay? Will their livelihood to their dog and set up a trust fund for their dog. And like, you can do it. It's a free country. But the Bible doesn't call that a marriage. You can't marry your dog. Are you here? It's one wife. You can't have three. Now, some cultures you can, but in the Bible, you can. It's, it's a monotheistic, one God, three persons. They're not a hundred million gods. It's one man, one woman, one, one Bible, one, one father, one son, one Holy Spirit. Are you here? It, you can't change that. That's our faith. And, and, and if that's offensive, I'm sorry. We still love you, but we can't change what this is about because then it's no longer Christianity. Are you here? And so we need to get back to it. It's so simple, but we miss it. And people, you know, do it. Do I agree with, disagree with my wife sometimes? Yes. On most things we agree, but sometimes we disagree. Well, we choose to disagree, yeah. you know. And God may speak to me and later I agree. <laughs> or, or that's happened before. Or maybe God speaks to her and later she agrees. Are you here? But, but you know, the toilet paper is still supposed to be on the top. I don't care what you say. But, but. But hey, it still works either way. Are you here? <laughs> and so, you know, major on the mi major, we need major, not on the minors, but we can agree to disagree and still love each other. What happens? We let the little things come and cause division. Don't let the things cause it. There's always the person sitting next to you, whether they're a spouse or a friend or a, an acquaintance, we're all different. Yes. Are you here? And so we need to understand, but we can still walk in love. And that's peculiar to the world. Because the world, you got to believe what I believe and say what I say and do what I say. That's, that's not realistic in, 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 in how we live as a Christian. Are you here? So how do we, what kind of people are God's looking for? He's looking for people who will serve him. He's looking for a peculiar people that will hold his values, that will be set apart for him, that will not be, will be uncompromising in the truth. Yeah. Number three. God is looking also for a holy people. Someone say a holy people. holy people. 
First Peter 2 verse 9, it says, but you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. There's that word. That means actually peculiar people. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So what do we say? Well, he says we're a royal priesthood. Now, when we think of priests, what do we think of? The guy with the collar, you know, the guy with the long robes, you know, even for us, we don't call me priest, I'm a pastor, you know, priest has a certain thing. But priest is not an image, it's not a wardrobe. What is a priest? A priest is someone who ministers to the Lord. So when the Bible says we're a royal priesthood, what's, what's it say? Our, our, our primary calling, why were we created, is to worship God. Yeah. It's to worship God, to minister to the Lord. So we're to worship him, we're to serve him, we're to be set apart to him. We don't worship anything else. I love my wife, but I don't worship her. Yeah. Happy wife, happy life, there's some truth in that, but if you just live in to make your wife happy, you're gonna be very unhappy. Yes. And she is too. All right, that's a, a topic for marriage conference, maybe. <laughs> but but it's, that's not how it works. You, you, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta lead as the man. You've gotta put things in order. Yeah, we wanna serve one another and make each other happy, but I can't just be trying to make someone happy because they don't know what makes them happy sometimes. Women don't know what they want. Yeah. Come on. And if they do, they change their mind very often. <laughs> do you wanna order this? No, I don't want it. And then later they wanna eat yours. <laughs> you sure you don't want anything? No. Then later, can I try? Can I have a sip? You know, that's why I always buy the biggest of everything, just in case. <laughs> Are you here? And men, we don't know what we want either. Come on, you have a list of what you want, and you end up marrying something totally different. But it's what you needed. It's what you needed. <laughs> I'm trying to get off this. All right. <laughs> a holy people. We're a priesthood, a holy nation, set apart to God. But what is holiness? We think of holiness as, ooh, it's so supernatural and spiritual. You know, they built the temple that was holy. All the things built in the temple were built with human hands. It was built with wood. It was built with the, with the metals that they had, the lampstands and all of that. It was natural fire. It what didn't fall from heaven. The only thing that, that came from heaven was the glory. Are you here? And so it's not holy. This, this pulpit is holy, but guess what? It cracked. We had to get a new one. What does it mean to be whole? It's set apart. We value. This is where the word comes from. We don't let anybody get up here and talk nonsense. We don't rent out to other people that are going to come here and, and you, because this is set apart for the worship of God. But, but just because it's set apart doesn't mean it's perfect. And so we need to have the understanding. Being set apart is a decision. We're a holy people. We're what? We placed our life as an alt on the altar, a living sacrifice that, God, we want to serve you. We want to love you. We love your word, and we want to stand up for you want us to stand. We want to serve you in our generation. And as we do that, we're set apart in holiness. But what is holiness? It's not a very popular word. A lot of churches, we don't preach on holiness. We don't talk on holiness because what is holiness? It requires us becoming more like Jesus. And people, we don't want to get out of our comfort zone sometimes. We don't want to get out of our issues because it makes us uncomfortable. But if you go to church and you don't get uncomfortable sometime, you're in the wrong church. I hope I make you uncomfortable sometimes. Not uncomfortable in the natural sense of like, you got a nice seat there. Come on, that's the best 25-inch seat you can buy. But we're not talking about that kind of comfort. We're talking about in our lives because we all need to keep changing, you know, and, and getting to the place where we're growing. And so that, that's what we're talking about. It's unpopular. Why? Because few people count holiness as a goal. They count, don't count holiness as a value. But the Bible says a lot about holiness. I think the biblical mandate from holiness, it can really be summed up in three things. One, Maintaining a clean mouth. Yeah. Two, clean hands. Yeah. And three, a clean heart. Yeah. David said, create a clean heart in me. What does it mean to have a clean heart? It means that we don't allow things to come in and defile our heart. We don't allow, I was listening to one person say, you know, that they canceled their television and all of this. And I was thinking, what? And what do they do? No, they only watch on demand. Why? Because they don't want to just be on TV, whatever people want to put in, whatever commercial, you just have to watch it. They watch what they watch. They choose what they watch. Someone else is not going to determine what I'm listening to. Yeah. And I think there's some truth in that. Not that we can be religious with it. We need to know what's going on. Yeah. But be, watching what we put in, I don't have to be exposed to someone. I'm not going to listen to everything. There's some conversation I'm just like, 
I'm not going to be a part of this conversation. I'm in the marketplace sometimes. There's a conversation. They're having broke conversations. I'm just like, you know, I got an appointment. You know, like, I make an appointment. Are you here to get? Because I'm not going to. I'm not going to allow the wrong thing to come into my heart. Watch what we listen to. Watch what we watch. Are you here? Clean hands. Watch what you touch. Apostle Mike, you know, he's, I love Apostle Mike because he, he deals in deliverance and stuff, but he's not your typical deliverance guy. Most of them are very serious and very, you know, and he was always laughing. He's always fun. And he said this. He said, this is the key to, to staying pure. He said, you can looky, but you don't get to touchy. <laughs> and you look once and you don't touch. I think that's true. What's the problem? We looky, 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 and then we want it. Well, like a kid, you know, when you have a kid, everyone have a toddler. What do you do? They're here like, mommy, mommy, look, and they're touching everything. And you're like, don't touch it. And then they put their hands in their mouth. You're like, don't touch. You don't bring them into a glass shop. You don't bring them into a tank because you know they're going to touch everything. They're going to break something. You're going to end up buying it. But when we grow to maturity, it's knowing what not to touch. I don't touch the fire on the stove because I get burned. I'm not going to touch a snake. Because it will bite me <laughs> if it has a rattle. Come on, be careful. And I'm going to end up in the hot. I don't, I don't touch the things that can harm me because I have maturity. Yeah. And so we need to be careful that what we're touching at and, and what we're, we're, do, we're talking and speaking about uh, uh, in our mouth, the conversations that we have. Out of the abundance of heart, the mouth speaks. How do you know what's in your heart? Because of your mouth. But out of these three, I think the, mo- the di- more, more difficult one to keep clean is the heart. Because in the world we live and with the temptation and, and what we have, what, what happens? It, it requires diligence, diligence. The Bible says guard your heart with all diligence. you got to be dedicated. Why? Because our bodies, our minds, our hormones are geared to not developing purity. And that's what you have. Everything that's out there, look at this, you know. It's in your face. You can't go to the mall without having somebody half-dressed. You can Everything that comes, you can't watch a television show without someone jumping in bed. I came home last night, my wife was, something was on and she wasn't looking. I'm like, what, what is this? And we were laughing. We're like, that's why when we travel the world, everyone thinks Americans, everyone sleeps with everyone. Because on TV, I mean, that part, you watch an hour show and they slept with four people that time. And what people, that's how you think. When I first traveled to America, I'm like, everybody's like, oh, you're an American, you know, like, and I'm like, whoa, you know, that's not America. <laughs> that's Hollywood. But what, it's all, it's just in your face all the time. We got to be careful with what happens in our heart because it's around. You know, we, we, economy inflation's happening, so it's not a bad thing because we're losing weight because now they charge, raise the prices, but they give you less food. <laughs> you notice that? <laughs> but most people come like, when I go to America, we split every meal because one plate is like for three. Yeah. Not anymore, though, with inflation. They're cutting it down, but it's good for our health. Amen. Yeah. But everything's abundance and indulgence and, and that kind of thing. So we've got to, to understand that we've got to be holy. Holiness is not the denial of the good things God has created. That's religiosity. But what is holiness? Holiness is embracing the good things God's created in the context that he put it in. When God created the gold and the silver, what did he say? He said, it is good. Money is not bad. I said, money is not bad. The love of money is the root of all evil, the Bible says. If you think your money's bad, give it to us, and then you will realize we'll do something good with it, and then you'll realize how how good money is. Money solves problems. Are you here? Many of you got problems because you don't have enough money. Come on, $10,000 would solve some of your problems. I'm not giving it out like Pastor Susan gave 100 last week. All right. But I'm just saying. Are you here? People, I had the whole church run into the stage. <laughs> but that would solve some problems. That would probably, some of us would be able to sleep a little better at night. Some of us, would, are you here? 50,000 might solve even bigger problems. But money solves problems. We need money. It takes money to do ministry. Just our internet bill to broadcast all around the world is $1,000 a month. $998 just to have the bandwidth to, to broadcast to the nation so we're not. So you were checking your channel. <laughs> it, it costs money to reach the nation. It costs money. Plane tickets are expensive. Hotels are expensive. 
Think food has gone up. Everything's gone up. It costs money to do it. But money is a tool that God has given us to prosper us. But we've got to use it the right way. Sex is a good thing yeah. when you're married. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Enjoy the freedom of singlehood when you're single. <laughs> and when you're married, you don't have the freedom of singlehood, but you got freedoms that the singles don't have. Yeah. Are you here? Enjoy the season of single. Enjoy the season of marriage. Enjoy putting things in the right perspective. If we do it according to God's pattern, it's good. And part of purity is doing that. Putting things in the right thing and the way God has intended it to be. Food is good. There's lots of feasts in the Bible. But sometimes you need to fast. Not do this seafood diet. Everything I see, I eat. That's not a diet. Are you here? It's the moderation. It's putting things in, in God's perspective. Proverbs 24, verse 16 says, For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. What does it say? If you mess up, get up and repent. There's grace. Get up and get back and ask God to help you. But sometimes we need to change and adjust things for holiness. If you want to be holy, you've got to walk around certain people, be around certain people. You can't be around people that are just playing with sin all the time. If that's where you're tempted. If you have a problem with drinking, you can't hang around with alcoholics that drink all the time. If you had a problem with substance abuse, don't hang around with people that are abusing substance. If you had a problem with sexual appetite and, and sexual addiction, don't get around people that that's their problem. Get around people so you're strong. The blind can't help the blind. Are you here? Leave the blind. We, we need to get to that place. And so, but when we mess up, get up again. God doesn't, is, is not just giving us one chance. He's given us his grace so that we continue to grow. We can learn what not to do and we can learn how to do things better. Can you say amen? amen. And sometimes it's difficult, but guess what? There's a reward. There's a price for holiness. But what's the reward? Matthew 5 verse 8 says this. Oh, how happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Come on, when you're pure in heart, there's a joy, there's a happiness that comes. And guess what? We get to see God. We get to walk in his glory. We get to walk in his presence. And that outweighs anything this world has to offer. Amen? What do we learn today? I'd like the musicians to come. What kind of people is God looking for? Number one, people who will serve him. Number two, people who will what? Be peculiar. That they will be his prize. He's a jealous God and we live for him alone. Number three, that they will be a holy people. A pure heart, clean lips, clean hands. And finally, number four, God is looking for a people of inheritance. Inheritance. What does God say? Deuteronomy 4 verse 20. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace out of Egypt. To what? To be his people and inheritance as you are this day. God is looking for sons and daughters. But what is his inheritance? We don't have a lot of understanding of inheritance. Because, you know, many times in our Western culture, I've even heard wealthy people. They're like, well, I ain't giving my kids nothing. I don't want them to be lazy. You know? I worked hard for every penny and I'm gonna take it all with me. But that's not the Bible. The Bible says that we don't provide for our family, that we don't leave an inheritance. That, that, that's not kingdom. What is an inheritance? It's not that we just have raise up lazy people. We need to raise them in the right values and things like that. Our ki my kids, you know, thank God that they don't have to grow up. I grew up, I grew up in a divorced family. I worked since I was 14, even though my parents did their best, but I had to live a certain way because things were tight. But think of my kids, they can focus on their studies. They've learned to work, they've learned to manage money, but we can provide for them. We can help them with their college. We can do those things. That's a good thing. Because what's an inheritance where they, they don't start where we started, but they start on our shoulders. And then our grandchildren start on their shoulders. And our great-great-grandchildren start on their shoulders. And what happened? God's the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But guess what? Isaac had more than Abraham. Jacob had more than Isaac, had more than Abraham. And what happened? It keeps, well, that's what we're doing. Where we can keep moving forward, where we can keep prospering, where we can exp experience the good of God. But what's the inheritance? He says that we would inherit the earth. What's our inheritance? Dominion in this earth. It's not just about money. It's not about resources. It's not about cars and houses. All those things, nothing wrong with those things, but you can't take them with you. 
God, David, Bible says David served God in his generation. What did he do? He served God and he left a legacy for his son who was able to build the temple. And he, David brought the money and he fought the enemies. He had all the, 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 you know, the war chest ready. And Solomon came in. All right, I'm going to take the baton and I'm going to continue in the legacy of God. That's what we're called to do. Matthew 5 verse 5 says, Blessed, empowered, to prosper are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. God's called us to be a, a, a people of, of promise and inheritance. What? Will we inherit the earth? Abraham, you know, was a man of faith, but really it started, I mentioned earlier, with Abraham, with Adam and Eve. And what did God do? God said, be fruitful, multiply, raise me a family that will subdue the earth, that you'll walk in dominion. God's called us to have dominion. Not that we'd have dominion over us, that we would walk in dominion. And God reiterated that in the Abrahamic covenant. What, what was it? I want us to stand on our feet. And I want to declare this over you. This was the covenant. This is the inheritance of walking with God. This is, and, and this was Old Testament. How much more in the New Testament, when the, based on the finished work of Christ on the cross, where now we're under the covenant, we have the Holy Spirit living in us, should we not supersede this? What is it? God wants us to what? Establish us as a holy people to himself. Just as he's sworn to us. He says, if you keep the commandments of the Lord, you walk in holiness, you serve him. Yes. You're willing to be a peculiar people. This is your inheritance. Let's read together verse 16. Starting now, it says, then all the peoples of the earth. Do we have it? Then what? Let's go back. The Lord what will establish you to be just as he has sworn to you. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body and in the increase of your livestock and the produce of your ground. In the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you, the Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land and its season and debt over our lives. That we're not under debt, we're not under bondage, but what we're prospering. We can lend to nations, we will not borrow. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You'll be above only and not beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I commanded you today, and be careful to observe them so you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I commanded you this day to the left or the right or go after other gods and serve them. What does God say? If you don't turn to the left or the right, you keep serving me, you keep honoring me, you walk in holiness, you know that you're my people, call by my name, what do you say? You will be the head and not the tail. You'll be first and not last. Come on, you're gonna prosper in your, in your womb and bear four children. You're gonna prosper in the field. You're gonna prosper in every area of your life if you serve God. That's our inheritance. Stop believing. Well, I just believe in God. I can get a new race. This people, Sophia was telling me she got, she's been in her job three years. She's got two promotions and three raises. Why not? There was another person, Maria, in the service said she got four raises in the last year. Let me tell you, how do you, how do you get promoted? How do you get raised? Go there with a kingdom mindset. Don't go to there, I work and making this an hour and this is what I do and this is my job and that's not my job. Go there and I'm here to represent God and to solve problems. How do you get a raise? Solve problems for your boss that you're so valuable that they can never let you go. What, what's your job? To work them out of a job to make their life easier. Guess what? Every time there's a time for promotion, you're gonna get promotion. I was talking to somebody the other day. They're, they said, we get promotions in March, but I'm already getting a promotion in February. <laughs> where where the, the, the director came to him and said, I need you. I need you. Because we're gonna expand, we're gonna do this, and I need you. And he said, you got me. When's the last time someone came to say, I need you, I need what you have? Do you know how you make money? Do you know how you really prosper? Solve problems for rich people. Yeah. Now we want to help everybody serve it, but, but when there's a rich person, solve the problem for them, they'll pay premium. Yeah. 
because they, they're sick of their problem. That's how you make money. That's how the world works. They make money. What happened? Somebody solved the problem of a fax machine and created a phone. And I have an iPhone. You can have an Android or whatever you have. I'm not here to promote Apple, but this solves a lot of my problems. This allows me to travel the nations and still do real estate, still run a church, still disciple people. But I remember when I was in Malaysia and I was a missionary, I had to write out a fax and set a one-page fax and it was $6 to send that fax to America. If I called back, it was $3.80 a minute to talk to somebody. And if you called during peak time, it was six twenty-five. And I didn't get to talk to my family. And now my wife's traveling and she's in the car and we're FaceTiming for free. I don't mind paying $1,000 to solve that kind of problem. Are you here? Solving problems for people, making life easier. You know how to make money? Let me tell you. Think of a way to contain all this water in, a, in California. We're always in a drought. Look at all the water we have. I drove to church this morning. I was so happy. I looked up at the hills. They're not brown, they're green. We got more snow on the mountains in Northern California, historical levels of snow and some places. I wanna go skiing. Come on, anyone else? Come back to church, amen. And all of it, and what happened is rushing into the ocean. Solve the problem. Think, there's problems out there. Just creatively, but why couldn't I have been the person who invented the paperclip? It's not rocket science, but it solves some problems in keeping together. The person that invented the stapler. The, what the person that, the person that invented the light bulb that didn't give up. Come on, that's the creativity of God. And think about solving problems. Don't just think about getting a paycheck in my nine to five. How can we solve problems in our work? How can we solve problems? If you're an entrepreneur, what's the thing? Don't just, well, I like this thing. I hope people like it. Let me try to sell it. What is the thing that you can come up with to solve people's needs? What's the product out there that everybody needs? They're buying from somebody. Why not buy from you? Look at it. We need to have this spirit, the entrepreneur spirit, to be able to look at the creativity, creating streams of income, solving problems for people, not just looking at what we want, but what is the problem that God has called us to solve? Are you here? And we don't do it for free. Because premium investment, we, we deserve a premium return. Are you here? That's the blessing of God, that we prosper in the market. Well, our cows prosper. We're not in agriculture, but what I'm saying, what does that mean to you? Your industry prospers. Every industry that was available then is named. That in every industry, God wants to prosper you. But it comes from God. We need to stop thinking in this lack mentality. It's expensive in Orange County. Yeah, there's a lot of money here too. Have you been to Laguna lately? Tens of millions of dollars. Come on. And yes, some of them aren't living the right lifestyle. We're not here to judge, but they also know how to do business. Why not us? Why not prospering? Why not, as we're holy, we carry the wisdom of God. We carry the anointing of God. We walk in the authority of God and we start changing our world and God gives us influence. We walk into the city council meeting with the wisdom of God to solve the problems. They got a homeless problem. Let's do this. And guess what? We get influence because it works because we know how to cast out demons, because we know how to heal the heart, that we know how to pray for the sick and deal with mental illness. Are you here? God wants to raise us up in this hour. Come on, where well, we are people that, that we're set apart for God. We don't compromise. We don't have to do it the way of the world. We don't have to cheat. We don't have to be dishonest. We don't have to run over and use people to get to the top. We can do it the right way because we're ultimately serving God. It's not for our glory, it's for His glory. And yet, does God take care of us? Of course He does. But ultimately, it's that His kingdom would prosper. That what? Come on, we need a building. Come on, we need about five, six million dollar dollars. That's a lot of money, that's not a lot of money. I was in Singapore and people in their 20s raised 42 million dollars, because it costs more there. If God could do it for $42 million through people in their 20s who are just starting out working, can He do it here? Of course He can. What's five, six million dollars? But, but we need to prosper. 
We need to believe that we can have influence. We need to have influence. Why? Because we have influence. What happens? All the people are coming in because they want to, we invite them to come and meet the family. Because we're, we're there bringing the life of God. We're there bringing the presence of God. We're there bringing the wisdom of God. Because we're holy. We're set apart from God. And God puts our hand, to, as we put our hand to the plow, we bear forth fruit. We're the head and the, not the tail. We're first and not last. What? Even in the midst of a recession, of inflation, what? Isaac sowed and prospered. Do you think that didn't get the attention of his neighbors? Are you here? Not for our sake. But for God's sake, we need to renew our mind. We need to get rid of our religious thinking that has this old pious, it's a form, but there's no power in it. Let's stop calling the things that God calls good, bad. Let's not have it a form that we think is pious and religious, but there's no power in it. Are you here? We can go on and on and on in our family. Come on, we do our family right. We live our family. Some parents, I hear what, what, they, how they, what they let their kids do and what they're doing, and, you know, 14 years old dating been together for two years, three years. I'm like, you're 14. That's a, that's a recipe for a disaster. We don't have to go the way of the world. I'm not saying you have to do things the way I do, but, but do things right. Even though it's not popular, but we raise our children in the ways of God. When they're older, it's between them and God, but we did the best. We put everything in them, and the Bible says they'll not depart from it. Well, my, my friend's mom does this. My friend's dad does this. Yeah, but they're not even together. Come on, let's take advice from people that have fruit. Take advice from people that are doing it according to the Word of God. Come on, the Word of God is a light and a lamp unto our past. Come on, lift your hands. Come, Come on, let's, let's thank, thank God, God for His covenant. covenant. Let's <laughs> thank God for His blessing. Come on, tell God, God, I want to serve you. God, I'm willing to be a peculiar people. God, I celebrate holiness. Create in me a clean heart, clean hands, a clean mouth. And God, let me be a people of inheritance that you raise me up in the nation. Raise me up to shine for you. Come on, begin to pray. Oh, God, remove every wrong mindset, every religious mindset that cause the word to be of no effect, God. Let it be uprooted from our minds. God, that we have a covenant with you. Doesn't matter our education level. It doesn't matter what we have in the bank. Doesn't matter the connections we have. But God, it matters that you are for us. And as you are for us, what can stand against us? God, as one rises at our left, you said 10,000 will fall at our right. God, we thank you for your inheritance, the riches of the inheritance of Jesus, of salvation in our life, a blessing, of prosperity, God, of creativity. God, let it come upon us. God, this year, God, we will rise up. This year, God, we'll see promotion after promotion. God, give us a heart to serve. God, we're not serving man, we're serving you. And out of that heart to serve, God, we come in the place that you put us and we prosper and we work hard and we're a blessing, God. Father, we declare promotion. We declare blessing coming upon every single person, God. Raise us up to be a living testimony of your goodness, of your faithfulness, of your glory in the name of Jesus. Come on, begin to pray. Oh, God, here we are. God, here am I. Send me. God, here I am. Use me for your glory, God. Use me for your glory. Break off every limitation in our thinking. Break off every limitation, God. God, we declare prosperity, abundance. We declare debt is broken over our life. We declare lack is broken over our life. We declare limited thinking is broken off of our lives. And God, we're gonna move forward in the promise of God for your glory, God, for your glory, for your namesake, for your kingdom, for yours is the kingdom forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Yes. Open up open the heavens in this place. Come now. Jesus, we just want to see your face. Come now. Holy Spirit, move here. Come and move around. Oh, yeah. It comes.
Holy Spirit, we pray you would move in our lives. Open up our eyes to begin to see. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear what you have prepared for us. That God prospering is not about a money, monetary number. God, it's about being in your will. It's about building your kingdom. It's about being a part of what you're desiring. That God, we would see things with your eyes. That we would walk with a heavenly purpose in all that we do. And Father, I pray for the blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ. The communion of the Holy Spirit to be upon every single person. And as we go forth this week, God, as we wake up on Monday, we won't say, oh my gosh, it's Monday, Friday's coming. But God, as we wake up, we'll say, Holy Spirit, let's go. Come now, Jesus, come now. Open up the atmosphere, open up the heavens and work with us. Prosper the work of our hands. And God, we would glorify you in all that we do. So we honor you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the covenant that we have for you the finished work of Christ on the cross, that we're sons and daughters and you have given us an inheritance. We honor you, we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, come on, let's give the Lord a shout. Yeah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, glad you came today, amen. Come on, slap our fives with your neighbor and say, you are a son or you are a daughter of God. Come on, go forth in the blessing of the Lord. We're glad that you're tuned in. If you're just uh, tuned in, we, we'd love for you to just text us uh, the word hello. And uh, we have some information for you. If you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, text the word follow to the number that's there on your screen. And uh, we'd love to help you to get into a church here in Orange County. Come and visit us or in wherever you're at, write to us. We'll help you get into church. God bless you. Thanks so much for joining us today at City Harvest. We're glad you came. We hope that you take whatever God spoke to you and apply it to your life today. That's right. And if you made a decision to follow Christ today, we want to welcome you into the family and we celebrate the decision that you have made to follow Jesus. Yes. If so, please text the word follow to the number on the screen. We'd love to bless you with a free gift to get you started on your walk. And we want to invite you to join us next week, but be sure to bring someone along. Bring your friends, your family, your community. And remember, we have a bright future here at CHC together.